and welcome to the Belmont Journal, Belmont's news program and community update. And I'm your host, Mike Crowley. And first, um, moving into community updates, um, as a reminder, the Belmont Public Works Department is holding a special cardboard drop-off event for residents only on Saturday, December 18th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the DPW yard at 37 C Street. Cardboard must be flattened. Residents are required to stay in their vehicle and pre-registration also is required on the town website. And please also note there is a $5 fee per vehicle. At the beginning of the COVID-19 epic pandemic, Belmont Books partnered with Belmont, Arlington, Watertown, and Waltham Public Schools to bring new books to children in, in need. Thanks to donations and support, they were able to distribute over 1,300 books to kids aged 3 to 18 and nurture their love of reading while schools and libraries remained closed. This holiday season, they are partnering, partnering with Frugal Bookstore, Roxbury's Black-owned independent bookstore, to bring acclaimed artist and children's book illustrator Akua Holmes and award-winning author Trisha Elam Walker into the Roxbury and Belmont area classrooms to share their inspiring new picture book, Dream Street. You can participate in this effort by donating to Read It Forward through Belmont Books. There's more info on their website or in the store. Fall sports are over, and for Paul Graham, who has been the girls' varsity soccer coach for 30 years, the end of this season brings a particular feeling. Joanna Jubilus brings us the story. My name is Paul Graham. I'm the girls' varsity soccer coach. This is my 29th year with the girls. I've coached in Belmont one level or another from, believe it or not, 1975. Oh, I just love the, the kids. It's all about the kids. You know, people always ask me how many wins I have and stuff like that. I have no idea. But I don't have any wins. The kids the kids do it all. It's just so rewarding to see so many kids that come through my program play in college. Uh, we have kids in Division One, Two, and Three right now, which is that's what it's all about. It's all about the kids. This year's soccer team, well, it's we're back playing regular soccer, which is which is a plus. Here the last year where we had to wear masks and the rules were all changed. But this year we're back to normal. Uh, we have 26 people on our roster, which is more than normal. Uh, it's very competitive. We've got, you know, uh, 17 of the 26 are underclassmen, so we're fairly young because we did, we couldn't bring a lot of kids up last year because of COVID. So this year they're all up. Uh, we played 22 in the, out of 22 in the game the other night. We uh, played very well. We won four to two. So we're very deep, and we're going to be a team that's tough to beat as we get more experience. And this is the first year we've been moved up to Division One, so it'll be very interesting to see how we do. We're so used to playing all the Division Two teams, you know, the, the Winchesters and Danvers and. Newburyport and teams like that, so it'll be a little different playing Division One teams. So, but uh, the whole goal is to put, make the tournament, and then after that, it's uh, it's anybody's ball game. <laughs> to be a good coach, I think you have to be very understanding. You uh, have to respect the girls and have to hope the girls respect you. I think fairness is a is a big part of my coaching. I try and play as many players as I can every game. They all work hard and practice. Uh, I want them to have fun also. Uh, only two, three players a year are going to go on to college. So you want the other 18, 19, whatever it is, to enjoy themselves and make it something that they'll remember forever. And now our regular weekly interview with Franklin Tucker, editor of the Belmontonian, follows. Frederic Rigolo hosts the segment. So welcome back, Franklin. And first story this week is about tax rate and property property tax rate. The yeah, board of uh, assessors voted that uh, the tax rate for uh, residential and commercial property 
will increase by two cents well, to eleven dollars and fifty six cents per thousand assessed value. That will increase the average uh, homeowner's uh, rate uh, of tax bill by uh, two hundred and sixty two dollars. Uh, and that average house now in Belmont is a ridiculous one point three five million dollars. So Belmont's total value of uh, taxable real estate is now at uh, $99.4 million. That's how much the, the, the amount of money that's coming into the coffers, to town's coffers. And that includes a, a debt exclusion of about $12 million. And it's kind of surprised me to see that, that we're still paying uh, $1.5 million per year on the Wellington School, oh. which has been built almost 25 years ago. And... Uh, well, we're also seeing $5.3 million uh, in terms of the high school and you know, the first uh, the first $100 million trench. So basically what Belmont is paying is $12 million a year to pay down its debt. Uh, um, and that has a, a cost. If we didn't have to pay that increase uh, with debt exclusions, uh, the tax rate would be $10.29 cents per $10.29 per uh, thousand. And this increases it by well over a dollar. And um, you would think that, you know, the, the tax rate uh, de- being decreased by uh, two cents would be the good news uh, for uh, residents. But in fact, what happened is that uh, any savings or any moderate uh, increase was offset by the increase in assessed values uh, of real estate. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't like in past, like I think it was three or four years ago when it went up nearly 15, 20%. Uh, it was a it was a smaller uh, increase, um, more of the four percent kind. That the big increase in last year's tax tax bill, I should say, a lot of that had to do with just the high, high school uh, debt exclusion that was coming on. That I mean, that increased everything by fifty five cents. And then you look up at that last year. Also, the, you had phase two of the high school that increased it by forty cents. That was the big increase. And of course, uh, assessed values were, were much higher. What we're seeing is a moderating assessed value rate uh, simply because of uh, COVID. I'm going to know how it's very hard to sell a house when you know, there's a pandemic coming along. Now, what, now the uh, Board of Assessors uh, voted and approved this uh, new rate. Uh, the Board of Selectmen had to decide whether we we're going to have a split rate uh, between commercial and real estate. That means a different tax rate for uh, residential property and homes and the commercial base which we have a very small amount. We only have 4% commercial uh, in the town. So even if you did a, a $10 split, uh, meaning put $10 more towards commercial, the uh, tax rate for residential property would just go down to $11.24. And, but on commercial side, it would go up to $17.34. And uh, there was a resident who said, is there any empirical evidence that a split rate, you know, a higher rate for commercial would have um, a detrimental effect. Dan uh, Dagron, Dargon, I should say, who is the um, the uh, administrator for the assessor's office, said that he did see when he was over in Framingham that um, businesses would decide to go to Natick rather than go to Framingham simply because they had um, a, a cheaper or I should say a lower commercial tax rate. You know, there was also a, uh, whether to have a home a homeowner's exemption you know, lower the rate for people who are homeowners rather than um, people who who own uh, property um, and don't live there. And that also turned out to be not much of a, uh, of a savings for people. So uh, the, the select board year in and year out basically uh, uh, says no to both the exemption and the split rate for commercial and residential property. And second story, you have some great news about one of the sophomore, BHS sophomore, I think she might be this year, uh, Ellie Shea, is going to San Francisco. No, she's going to San Diego. Uh, for the second time in four months, she's going to be running in a national um, uh, championship uh, for running. Uh, this one is not on the track like it was back in July. Uh, she'll be running in the uh, East Bay uh, Cross Country Championship. Uh, she was finished uh, sixth in the uh, Northeast Regional Championships, so she's uh, going there, uh, you, and she's going to have a great um, opportunity to show off her, her very good speed. I mean, just a, just about a month and a half ago, she uh, raced in a all-women's race at a prominent cross-country race in Boston, the Mayor's Cup, and she finished second. Not only did she finish second, but she also bested a uh, 
two-time Olympian who's a national record holder for the 10,000 meters. So she's primed. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going to be very exciting on the 11th of December. We are joined again by Lisa Gibellario with the Wayside Youth and Family Support Network and coordinator of the Belmont Wellness Coalition. And this week we're talking about fire prevention. So fire alarms seem like a good place to start, Lisa. What do we need to know? Uh, an excellent place to start. Um, first of all, Mike, fire alarms should be installed in homes or apartments on every living level. So if you have three floors, you should have at least three fire alarms. They should be tested frequently every couple of months at least. And it's really easy to do. There's often a test button that you can just press and it will make the sound of the alarm. Um, and the batteries I'm told should be changed twice a year. And a good rule of thumb is to do that on the fall back in the fall um, when we change the clocks and on the spring ahead when we put the clocks forward. So that's a good way to remember to change um, the batteries and the alarms themselves, the units themselves should be um, updated. Uh, new ones should be brought in about every 10 years. So what else is it important to do, Lisa? Well, if you have small children in the home, Mike, it's advised that you keep matches and lighters away from them, keep a close eye on them in the kitchen if they're near the stove, familiarize your children with the sound of the fire alarm and what to do if they hear it, um, and develop and practice an escape route plan. So Lisa, what might an escape plan look like? Um, well, first of all, you should identify, part of the plan would be identifying two exit routes out of the home. Um, it's really important um, that these exits be free and clear so that people can actually access them as exits. So no boxes in front of them, no furniture, no, you know, toy chests. Um, you should teach your children as part of the exit plan that smoke can be really incapacitating. Um, so if there is smoke to go low, to try to stay low because smoke will rise and just to proceed to those exits. And once outside, Mike, Call 911 immediately and stay outside. And this plan should be practiced as well. Okay. Anything else, Lisa? Yeah, just that with the holiday season upon us, you know, be careful with those menorahs, right? Because those are candles. Um, be careful about where you place a Christmas tree if you have one. It should be away from a fireplace, away from any burning candles. And a word on candles, never leave them unattended. Um, and always, if, you, if you're someone who likes to light a candle, keep it on a hard surface that is not flammable. So like a stone countertop is good. Um, same with fireplaces. Um, if you light a fire, don't leave that unattended. Be careful how you, you know, bank it and, and take care of it upon, you know, bedtime. Um, with regard to space heaters, it's certainly getting cold out there. Um, two points that I didn't know about space heaters. Um, one, that they should be plugged directly into a wall outlet, not onto an extension cord outlet. Um, and the other one, I guess, is we probably all do know is to be, you know, turn them off when you're going to sleep or obviously leaving the house. Um, I mentioned stoves and little ones. Kitchen fires are among the most common source of home fires. So be really mindful of not only what's on the stove, but what's next to the stove as far as pot holders or dish towels. They can catch fire um, and, you know, and little ones. And um, finally, teach your children that if, if, if the worst happens and they, there is any fire on their bodies, that the old adage stop drop to the ground and roll is a good way to put out a small fire. Um, the fire department has a, a safety program, fire safe program, and they do education. They go into the schools, they go into the Beach Street Center. So just know that you have information on the fire department's website. And if you wanted to get, if you're in charge of a Girl Scout troop or Boy Scout troop, and you want to um, get the fire department to do some additional education, they are very willing to do that. And now it's time for Joanna Jubilis' weekly segment. Joanna is a multimedia journalist with the Belmont Citizen Herald and Wicked Local Belmont. Frederic Rigolo hosts the segment today. Welcome back, Joanna. Um, and today, first story in the Citizen Herald is uh, public safety warnings. Tis the season for packages to be stolen and for online scams, Frederic. 
The Belmont police would like to warn residents that if you're expecting a package, please be sure to pay attention to the notifications you receive about the status of delivery. And if you're not going to be home, please make sure you tell a neighbor or a friend to pick up your package because packages left unattended, even for a short time, could get stolen. And there's also been an uptick in scams, particularly via email or text from what may appear to be a legitimate company you deal with, bank or Amazon, PayPal, Verizon. So you may receive an email that appears to be from Verizon saying your password's going to expire and asking you to click on a link to update your password or keep it the same. This is a scam, Frederick. And another one that appears to be from Amazon says your account has been locked because billing information provided doesn't match what they have in their files as the card user. It asks you to click on a link that says verify now and warns that if you don't take action immediately, all pending orders will be canceled and your account will be locked permanently. This is also a scam. Another one is a text that you might get from what appears to be your bank, Citizens Bank, saying there's been, an, there's been unusual activity on your account and click on a link to update your account information. Again, that, that's a scam. So you just gotta be careful. If you're not sure, just call your source and be careful because if you Google what you think might be PayPal customer service, this is another uh, incident that occurred. Someone Googled PayPal's customer service and called the number. It actually wasn't an 800 number. You really got to be careful these days. The, the internet, the computer can really play, play tricks on us and we can fall. And a uh, second story is looks like uh, if we are looking at the Belmont football varsity team, that football is something in the blood <laughs> or genes. <laughs> You're right. You're right, brother. A lot of brotherly love on this past fall season's Belmont High School varsity football team. And uh, if you went to any of the games like I did, and I think you were at a few yourself, Frederick, you would hear announcer Al Gledhill saying Arno to Arno during the football games. And that's because the quarterback was sophomore Jaden Arno, who liked to throw the ball to his older brother, Tyler. And they and he actually helped that um, they scored together four touchdowns this past season. So that was really something. And in addition to the Arnos, there were three other sets of siblings who, who played on the team, Zach and Nate Moss, Kevin and Brian Logan, and Jake and Max Cornelius. And this, according to um, the coach, Coach Brian McCray, he, he feels like this is an anomaly. He said in, the, in his 20 years of coaching, he has never seen so many brothers on the same varsity team. Now, keep in mind, next year, there will not be four sets of siblings because three of these brothers are graduating. Ah, yes. It'll only be the Cornelius brothers next year. McCray thinks having so many siblings on the same team uh, helped the team have a successful season, winning four of the nine games prior to Thanksgiving. And um, he also said the older brothers have been role models for their younger brothers. So it's just to, this is a feel-good story. So if you haven't seen it yet, please go to my uh, website. So, and now, a spoiler alert for a family with young children. Santa is coming to town and the Bel Belmont Lions Club is helping him. Yes, in case anyone hasn't heard yet, this is a, a big event and it's in its second year where the Belmont Lions Club actually helps Santa Claus visit families in Belmont. Many families have already signed up. In fact, about 160 families have already signed up. But the Belmont Lions Club wants to tell families who have children with special needs that it's not too late to sign up. They really, Santa would really like to visit families who have children with special needs and the deadline to sign up is December 14th. Simply email belmontlionsanta at gmail.com and they will, they wanna personalize the visit for these families. So they're gonna ask questions and get to know the ch children, you know, pass on the information to Santa so that he knows who these children are before he actually comes and visits because some children with special needs might be afraid of Santa. They may not want to hear the bells or see the lights. And this will make it an extra special experience for them. The Haitian refugee crisis has been in the news recently. Everyone will rec recall those videos of Haitian refu refugees hunted by mounted immigration police along the uh, southwest border. On December 9th, Belmont Against Racism and the Human Rights Commission are holding a panel discussion about this human crisis. 
With us today, Catherine Bonfiglio, Chair of Belmont Against Racism, and Kim Haley Jackson, Vice Chair of the Human Rights Commission. Kim, let me start with you. Can you tell us about the panel discussion? Why is this happening or why is this so important? We've heard a lot about immigration over the past few years. And recently, uh, given the most recent disaster in Haiti, here in Massachusetts, we'd had at least 100 Haitian families seeking uh, refuge here. Um, so really for us, it's about bringing um, education and awareness to the special plight that affects the Haitian population and also reminding our viewers that Massachusetts has perhaps, I believe, like the, the third highest um, Haitian immigrant population. So you know, a large part of our community um, within the greater Massachusetts area. So looking to bring awareness. All right. Um, Catherine, let me ask you about the um, specifics of the panel discussion and how you expect the um, panelists to, to approach the, the, the crisis. So we're very pleased. We have a fairly broad uh, panel. Um, and so we have with us uh, Pascal Robert, who is a writer and a political commentator uh, on Black politics, but also specifically on Haitian history and politics. We're hoping he'll give us some context. Ariel Sharma is a lawyer with Lawyers for Civil Rights. And uh, the Lawyers for Civil Rights uh, did file a complaint against those Border Patrol uh, folks for their treatment of the migrants. And so she's going to talk a little bit about their work and the ongoing complaint. Uh, we have a local uh, Haitian immigrant, Dr. Claire Exos. She, um, with her family, immigrated to Miami for about 20 years. She lived there, now lives in Belmont. So she'll talk a little bit about her personal experiences and a little bit about the Haitian diaspora. And then lastly, we have Dr. Gerald Gabro, and she is the executive director of the Immigrant Family Services Institute. That institute is currently helping about 500 migrant families recently, she said. So she will talk about her work, her work with this group, and how we as a community might be able to help some of these more recent migrants. So we are very excited about the breadth of the panel. Um, thank you, Catherine. And, and Kim, let me ask you, you mentioned the, the Haitian immigrant community in, in the larger state of Massachusetts. Do we have a Haitian community in Belmont? You know what? Not that I'm aware of, because typically when we look at data, we we're not going that in depth. But it would certainly be wonderful if uh, we could find that out. All right. And then um, let me let me ask you, Catherine, what can Belmont residents do um, besides participating or, or watching the panel discussion? Is there a way for, for Belmont residents to help? So I think if people go on to the website for the um, Immigrant Family Services Institute, it's out of Mattapan. Uh, they have ways in which they can, uh, ways in which you can help. And we are hoping to get a list of uh, services and, and resources for our listeners. And we'll provide that on the Belmont Against Racism website. Uh, of ways in which people can help both these recent immigrants and, and the institutes are working with uh, immigrants in our area. Well, thank you so much, uh, both Catherine and Kim. And, and um, as a reminder to the viewers, you can join the, pan the virtual panel discussion on the Haitian refugee crisis Thursday, December 9th at, 9, at 7 p.m. And they can watch it uh, both on, on Belmont Media, but you can also go onto the Belmont Against Racism website and join the webinar if you'd like to be able to ask questions of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And now for our community calendar. The Belmont Lions Club Christmas tree sale is back in front of the Lions Club on Royal Road. The sale is open from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m on Mondays through Fridays and from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. All proceeds will go to the Ed Walsh Foundation. The winter solstice tells us that winter is coming. How do people observe, this, observe the solstice and how do local animals cope with the changing conditions? Join the Massachusetts Audubon Habitat's Barbara Bates and consider how winter survival really is all about food. 
with this Zoom event organized by the Belmont Public Library on Thursday, December 9 at 6.30 p.m. Registration is required on the Belmont Public Library website. Getting short of gift ideas for your kids? Join children's book authors Josh Funk and Rajani LaRocca as they share their holiday gift book recommendations with Belmont Books via Zoom on Thursday, December 9 at 7 p.m. They will help you get your holiday shopping off on the right foot by providing holiday book recommendations for picture books and middle grade books register on the, the Belmont Books website. Send a handmade holiday card to those you love, near or far. Art instructor Audrey Childs returns to the Beach Street Center on Friday, December 10th at 1 p.m. for a special holiday card making workshop. Even if you have never painted before, the steps are easy. Call 617-993-2976 to register. The cost is $1 per card and envelope. The Belmont Gallery of Art and Belmont Art Association present the first Belmont Holiday Market on Saturday, December 11th from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. in the Town Hall parking lot at 455 Concord Avenue. Come and listen to the Belmont High School Madrigal Singers while having treats from Sweetheart Vegan Bakery and browse the work of local, local artists, jewelry, pottery, paintings, holiday cards, soaps, homemade biscuits for dogs, or even Christmas gnomes. Come and check them all out. And that's it for this week's edition of the Belmont Journal. As we sign off, we have a sneak peek of a Belmont High School pep rally held prior to Thanksgiving. It was the first major indoor event for all grades in one space, the videos by Joanna Jubilus. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Mike Crowley, and I will see you next time.